Where is my mind? That gives me the chance to introduce my next guest. And it's kind of hard to introduce him um, because his work and his words have kind of given me a, a much more clear understanding of what emotional intelligence, emotional liter literacy is, and emotional transparency, where vulnerability is a point of growth without ignoring the inevitability of pain and the kind of complexity of the human condition. But I think what his greatest influence on me from, from listening to him for years and reading him is his capacity and his desire to see beauty and hope in the simplest of things at the hardest of moments. And if you could clone Larry David, Neil Tobin, and Stephen Fry, I think we might get this guy. A woman's mind is very busy. And if it was a drawer, it's full of stuff, <laughs> right? A man's mind, he pretends is very busy. And he, <laughs> and he pretends is full of stuff. But if you open it, there's nothing in it. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, right? When I was in Mullingar, at one stage I was in a semi-detached, right? Yes. And sometimes you would turn off EastEnders to listen to the rows through... <laughs> No, they were more interesting. Yeah, I can imagine. Because you'd be following it from one day to the next. You know what I mean? <laughs> Depression is normal. Everybody suffers it. It's not an illness. And it's a point of growth. I remember when my mother was dying, uh, when she could barely breathe, we couldn't take fluids or liquids, but she'd love a little bit of arrow. The nurse would give her a little bit of arrow on her tongue and she'd suck it and she got pleasure out of that. And those tiny little small things as I've got older, I've found there's a huge spirit in them, there's a huge sense of us in those small things and it's such a privilege to write about them. What is an old fellow like me to say about repeal the Eighth Amendment? Well, I'd say this. I trust young people I trust young women. I think that they're the makings of this country. It is one of the most beautiful things about this island, I feel, is that we are storytellers. We tell stories the same as we play tunes. It's not religion you need. It's other people. Mm -hmm. It's other people. And the, the, the power of people that I love, who love me, who were around the bed, who are close. I realised, you know, you don't need anything when you're dying except other people yeah. to be with you. That's right. And that's all. That's what politicians hope for, that we will forget about injustice so that they can continue to do nothing. And those tiny little small things as I've got older, I've found there's a huge spirit in them, there's a huge sense of us in those small things, and it's such a privilege to write about them. And it's an extraordinary privilege to be among the great writers in this room and to be honoured like this. So thank you, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Harding. Find your spot. That couch has been well, it owes nothing to anybody. That couch, it's been around a long time. Um, Hello, what's going on? How you, are wore, you? you wore the stepping out shirt, huh? You wore the stepping out shirt. For I the did podcast. Die. Fair play. Huh. I, 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 thanks I, for I, having me here. Oh man, it's as, as, as I think watching that video, uh, the word we throw around the authentic, authenticity is, is um, the first thing I noted, and there was something you said in that. That I won't lie to you, the first time I heard it, it, it kind of it, it kind of unsettled me when you said depression is a point of growth. And it reminded me of that John Grant song, uh, Glacier, that this pain running through you is like a glacier um, carving out deep valleys and creating spectacular landscapes. Yeah. Um, what was this point of growth that you speak of? What was, what was you referring to in, in that really powerful interview? Well, um, <clears throat> I suppose I'm referring to the fact that, uh, say, 2011, 2012, I had a long period of, of depression. 
uh, but I realized that I, I also was always melancholic as a as a child growing up and uh, as an adult and uh, since 2012 until now there are always moments where I feel deeply sad mm. and there's moments where uh, I kind of fall off the cliff mm. emotionally so that uh, at the most unexpected times you feel a kind of a despondency is a word I'm using a lot. Uh, it, I, I think despondency is that sense that you just don't have the energy to do anything, you know? No matter what somebody asks you to do. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You'd be at the wedding and they'd say, when you get up and give us a dance, and you don't feel like it. Mm. And then the voice in your head says, you fucking idiot. Why wouldn't you get up and dance with her? She's beautiful. She's your wife, you know? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and so y you have, number one, the despondency that says no to beauty. And then you have the voice in your head like a torturer who says, you fucking idiot. <laughs> like how many, there's nobody in this room who hasn't stood in front of the mirror in a toilet somewhere and looked and said, you fucking <laughs> idiot. <laughs> for some shame or some thing that happened outside in the bar or even in the ordinary dining room where you live or something. So, so that dynamic can pull you down all the time, right? And the only thing that I'm saying about it is that it's like, it, if you can do what you were explaining earlier, which is between this moment of visceral invitation to respond and kill someone and there's a gap that we're saying between that and the response and if you can get into that gap for a second for a split second you will see yourself dying you will see yourself you'll see yourself it's like standing outside yourself and you see yourself and the minute you see yourself you're dead and that's what growth is about each time you see yourself, you are awake. And, and, and this word enlightenment only means to be awake. And enlightenment, you don't have to do anything to be enlightened. You're enlightened right now, in this second. Everybody in this room has achieved all that Buddha wanted to achieve. We are here. And all the 15 billion years or 13 billion years to get us here is, is just one endless necklace of miracles that allow you as an individual to be here and nobody has ever been like you and okay so you want to just be angry with somebody but there's a second there's always a second and in that second there's a space for you to die and the dying is like the skin of the snake that you leave behind you and you walk through that second and if you don't respond with, with your fist automatically it's growth. And that's what happens to me in depression. It's, it's, an, it's an awful place to be down. There's a beautiful book called The Swampland of the Soul. It's a book about saying you don't need to be up all the time. I knew a lovely travelling woman one time, Julia McDonough, in uh, Tullamore. I, I lived with travellers in Tullamore one time in a halting site. And I used to go to Julia for storytelling. And she's learned me more about storytelling than anybody. But she'd say to me, Michael, she'd say, were you in Mullingar for the party of Sunday night? Michael, did you see... This was a party for somebody 21st. Ah, uh, Michael, did you see after the party? 15 black bags collecting the rubbish and the food that they left behind them, you know. And if there was a poor person that set their ears back to that food now, Michael. But you see, these young people, Michael, they want to be up in the moon all the time. And then she'd look at me, her with 13 children. Michael, you know and I know you can't be up in the moon all the time. Mm. So you have to be down. Mm. Accepting you're down is a kind of a death. Mm. And it's also a growth because you become a new person in the next second. That's the John Grant lyric of creating spectacular landscapes. It's, it's the thing about my own journey with my mental health. Um, 
I don't think I'd ever have seen the world the way I see it now and how I explore it and how it, I engage with it if I hadn't gone through that. Yeah. And the thing being is, in a weird way, I'm, I'm not, this sounds as because it was 15 years of, of dealing with it. I'm, I, I kind of, I wouldn't change it. And that sounds like a weird thing to say because in the, maybe the last three, four years, where I discovered something that I know you talk really powerfully about and, and studied, and that's Buddhism. Mm. Because Buddhism was the thing that changed everything for me. And now I'm not a Buddhist, by the way. Um, mm. Before you get all, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, uh, I, I value it massively. Yeah, I, I am um, on Tuesdays. On Tuesdays, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Buddhist. I, I was a Buddhist, Buddhist for about, I did a, a, a silent retreat. After anyone who's done those silent retreats, holy sweet Jesus Christ. My, my parents were taking bets how long I'd last. That's yeah. what they were doing. But for the Buddhism, the first two things that kind of made sense to me about the world and psychology and was the first noble truth of Buddhism that yeah. said suffering is inevitable. Yeah. It's just part of life. And what the Buddha said is that we keep firing a second arrow. The yeah. first arrow of suffering, we can deal with. Grief, yeah. grief is hard as fuck, torturous. But most of us can deal with it. The second arrow of suffering is, it's my fault. I should have done more. Yeah. I should have been there more. And it's that constant need to fire the second arrow that often inflicts an awful lot of our suffering. Yeah. Have you learned to stop firing the second arrow? Are you? No, I haven't. But I'm more aware of it. Mm. You know, for me, enlightenment is being aware, even of the negativities in me, the depression in me, the despondency in me, to actually just be aware of the... Even if there's really negative things going through my mind, just be aware of them. That's enough. Mm. And if you're not aware, and if there are negative voices in your head, really saying, you know, kind of humiliating you in your head, like the echoes of some old teacher or something, or some cross parent, then, then if you're not aware, you're suffering like a slave to this voice. And, and yet, it, it's a huge thing to stand up and say, I, I can feel, I can hear, Michael. I can hear the negativity. I, it's okay, I'm, I'm here. You know, in a way, you become a mother to yourself. You become two people inside yourself. You embrace yourself. You whisper to yourself, it's okay. Mm. Stop listening to those negative voices. And just to talk quickly about religion, because religion is, is really a passion of mine. Uh, I love all religion. I really do. I, I really feel I'm a Christian. I'm a Buddhist. I don't know much about Hindu. I have Jewish blood in me from my great-grandmother. And I have a teacher at the moment who's teaching me about Islam. And, and they all have one single thing. Every great religion has one thing that the Greeks used to call the golden rule. And that is love and compassion. To think about other people is a way to happiness. Now that is really, mm. every religion comes down to that. So therefore the ideas in religion are, they're not true. I don't think I believe in God or anything. I really don't. But I behave as if I believed in God. Right? I use religion on the shelf with the psychology books, <laughs> with the gestalt and the family therapy and all the other therapies that I've done over my life. I also have my religion books. Because if you can use religious ideas, metaphors, not in your head, but in your body, as meditations, as mindfulness, as practices, and if they bring you into the here and now, in a, in a way that suddenly I am present with you and I don't feel anger and I love you, then they are fucking good. Mm -hmm. Religion doesn't have to be a god. Like, Buddha, is, like Buddhism isn't a god, there's no direct god. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a way of thinking, it's a way of being. Exactly. And it's your own truth. It's a therapy. Yeah. I'd, I'd say to anybody, like, I, I really would say, don't be believing in God. Get rid of the ideology. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's funny, isn't it? But, but honestly, when you begin to get 
I'll give you an old Asian story about this. This is a long conversation that's been going on for thousands of years, but, but there's a story about the old monk and the young monk, and they were in the boat, and there's a beautiful moon, and the old monk says, look, the moon. And the young monk looks at his finger, where it's pointing, and he sees the moon in a cloud, and he says, yes, it's beautiful. The moon is not the finger. Religion is only the finger. Mm. It's only a boat to get you across the river. The journey is to find a place where you experience love in your body and soul and eyes with the human beings around you. Th that's the trick. That's what every religion is trying to do. The, the ideas are only to get you there. That's why, again, in Asia, they say religion is a boat to get you across the river. You don't walk around with it on your head, which is what Westerners do. We, mm. we, we're constantly talking about, do you believe in God? Mm. If I said to people, I'm Christian, they say, well, oh, would you believe in the afterlife? I couldn't give a fuck about it. <laughs> I really couldn't give a fuck about the afterlife. <laughs> but I do know that here and now, if I follow what the boys were saying about that moment of space between, you know, before the cortex, when it's been overridden by this instinct, and you're invited to respond in a visceral way and you stop yourself, it's what the Buddhists in India call ahimsa, mm. non-violence. Just stop there. Just, just mm. for that split second. And part of you will die and something new is born, a new... Michael or a new Nile is born. That, that, that's a transformation that happens every second if you can have a kind of a non-violent in those moments. But also there is the sense that you talked about it earlier too and that was the sense of gratefulness. Mm. I, I learned a long time ago that there was enough people telling stories about being fucked up. And I thought, you know, sometimes it's harder to tell stories of what I saw in life that was beautiful, right? And I, I have a teacher at the moment, as I say, he's a, he's a guy from Syria. He's from Aleppo. And I says to him about two weeks ago, uh, I w he shows me how to make tea in the Turkish way and then in the Kurdish way. And these are beautiful moments we have together, like two men who love each other. Mm. I said, you'll have to come. We live near Bondorn. I said, you'll have to come up to Bondorn. And he looked at me and there was just a, a tiny shiver and I realised, we're not going to Bondorn. <laughs> so a little while after, I asked him, and he said, I lost my sister in the Mediterranean. She fell out of the boat, and her two children with her. He said, I'm not ready to go to Bondorn yet. Maybe later. Right? No. That's the kind of story that's behind every human being that we need to be welcoming into this island mm. and opening our hearts to them. Mm. They're human beings with beautiful stories. And they know how to make tea. Mm. <laughs> and they don't use tea bags. Mm. I think there's something I heard a young kid say about this particular area. It was actually in London. And they had this phrase that says, don't, tell, don't go back to where you're from, tell me about where you're from. Yeah. And the fundamental difference. So when you talk about religion, um, our new religion is technology. Yeah. And let me break this down a little bit. Um, there's something that, from your work, your words, and your interviews that I've watched over the years, is your capacity to see very, very beautiful things and very simple things. And what's happened with technology now, um, I spoke about this in the podcast, that there's a war for our attention. Mm. And we don't own our attention anymore. Attention's become the new oil, as I, as I say and we don't own it anymore. So we don't know where to place it or who to place it on. And an awful, I think a reason a lot of us are getting overwhelmed is because our relationships are breaking down because we're not giving presence to the people we love. We think giving presence to them is being in the room. Is it fuck? It's being able to engage with them, sit with them, listen to them, talk about not wanting to go to Bundoran. This is the difference and this fundamental presence. And the work that you've been doing and one of the things you said there, when, you, when your mother was passing away, the simplicity of the pleasure she got from a piece of chocolate. Yeah. Was this something you learnt through 
the adversity and the depression and, and your illness and your heart, heart attacks, is this something you've learnt or is it something that just came naturally? Just the ability, even in the depths of the darkness, you were able to see these little flashes. Is that something you've always had? No. I'm not... Believe me on this. I, I really mean that I love religion, but don't take it like truth. Mm. Don't take it like ideology and all this other crap. And don't take it like in institutions. But, but in your heart, use the ideas physically and get somewhere. Uh, did I see the little stories or how did I become who I am as a storyteller? I became who I am because I'm a failure. And again, I'm saying this, there's no facetiousness in this. I'm not smart. I'm not a smart human being. I'm not a, a bright human being. I didn't have much prospects of a great career anyway. And I was never an alpha male. Like when the two boys were up here, you know the two cartoon fuckers, mm. right? Th there's a third boy. <laughs> there's a third boy who hides behind Clint Eastwood, <laughs> shitting himself in fear. But he just says, hang, hang close to your man and you'll be safe. <laughs> right? And that's the beta male. And I have been that all my life. Do you know what I mean? I've often gone out trying to quote a woman when I was young and I'd end up chatting to her about the fella she liked. <laughs> Which is really fucking sad, you know. I used to drive them, I'd be driving them from Glen Gavlin to the Baltimore Romance in Glen Farn and back again, five lovely women, all of which I would have loved to, I won't say anything vulgar, but to, to make love with. <laughs> and all I'd get is big mugs of tea in the kitchen when we'd come home, <laughs> and they'd be telling me about this fucking guard and that guard that they liked, <laughs> and how they didn't get off with them, right? And that's a beta male. And what the beta male does is figure out by the age of about 10, when there's bullies everywhere, you can't play football. I've been once out on a football pitch in my whole fucking life. <laughs> and I lasted 10 minutes in a pair of short togs and my father hardly shouted, go home, Harding. <laughs> that was the end of me. But when you, when you do those things, you learn, how do I survive here behind Clint Eastwood? Make him laugh. <laughs> or tell him an old story, right? So you could always rely on me to be the one to tell you a story of what just happened in an interesting way. That was my survival trick. It wasn't something I chose. And even I was doing it like when I was a teenager, I'd write little poems and they'd say, Someday I'll go to the city and I look at the filth and the dirt and I roll around in it for poets are a dirty lot. And my jeans will be faded, my hair in a mess. And I'll write of death and decaying matter and how I had an unhappy childhood. And all will say the boy is talent for he lives like a beggar and writes what he shouldn't. Now I wrote that when I was about 14 or 15. And my father read it. He said, and, and did, did you have an unhappy childhood? <laughs> <laughs> he did. And I, I said, I did, yeah, I did. And he said, did we do anything wrong to you? And I said, not really, but I don't know. <laughs> and, and even at that stage, yeah. I was melancholy. Yeah, yeah. But I found a great joy in telling stories. And I think that when you're telling stories, you, you lose being possessed by your own ego, mm. right? So when I got trapped in, in sadness as a teenager, and, and serious melancholy, to just make up a story or to read a story became a beautiful escape. And I used to listen to my mother, I used to listen to old people, and I still do. And I tell you, I was coming up to Christmas. I was with my mother one day in the Farnham Hotel in Calvin. This is many years ago, before she died. And... Uh, I'd be sitting there thinking, I have to bring me fucking mother out for the dinner again. It's wearing me out. <laughs> and yet all I had to do was say to her, as we looked at our old roast beef, I'd say, Mammy, do you remember the Farnham Hotel when you were young? And immediately she'd start off like, oh, sure, we used to come in here, but Mrs. Riley used to throw us out all the time, you know. 
just because we were running up the stairs. And she'd suddenly be into stories about me aunt smoking cigarettes and ha helping. So she, she'd create a life in front of you. And that's what stories do. And I think that stories is the great Irish therapy. You know what I mean? That you could have storytelling therapy and you could heal an awful lot of sadness in people simply by sitting around and saying, Tell it, what's your mother like? And I find it an interesting thing. I'm not going on too long. Not at all, but, no. And it, there's an interesting thing. Do you ever know, you'd be young people, you probably do have sex in that time. <laughs> and I, I, it's probably all different from when I was doing it. But, <laughs> well, on a second, I thought, I thought you, were get, you weren't getting not, you were getting cups of tea. But when, when, you, when we... You, oh, well, that was, you know, there was a not good night for fuck's sake. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you, got a, you got a club milk as well. <laughs> the first time, the first time I made love <laughs> was with an American in Mayo. <laughs> she was an American student and we're hitching around Connemara at Halloween and she had a rucksack. She had a rucksack with make love not war on it. <laughs> and I took that as a sign. <laughs> And we booked into a little pub, no, a little, a little bed and breakfast in Lewisburg. And I won't say the name of it because I, I remember saying it in public one night and let's say the name was McCormick and this one came up to me afterwards and said, my name is McCormick, I'm from Lewisburg. But anyway, making love in those days was always followed by a cigarette <laughs> on the pillow. And that was the time, I remember, that was the time you'd say... They vape now, yeah. Yeah, after sex. What part of Mullingar did you say? <laughs> your, fa your father's a farmer, is he? And the amount of conversations about who, are, who am I that happen... I know they're supposed to happen pre kitel and not post kitel but that's the way you're living, <laughs> fuck it, you know. But it's the way that in the most meaningful moment of your life, when, you, when you've touched intimately the other person physically, which is beyond meaning, which is kind of an experience that you have word for called orgasm. Mm. And in that beauty, in that beauty, what, what do people fucking do? They start telling stories about their father and their mother. <laughs> you know, it's extraordinary. So, so I think that this thing of storytelling it's hugely transformative and it's hugely giving, it's hugely forgiving, and it, it sings the music of gratefulness, always. So. I don't, I, I don't even know how to follow that, that the, uh, <laughs> the, the cigarettes after sex. Um, what I'd like to probably finally ask you, Michael, and I'm going off the video. Um, I actually edited that video on, on a flight back from America, and I had all these, and I, I watched hours of interviews that you've done. Okay. I could have put hours up there. I really could have, like, they're really just, uh, you have a very incredible skill, um, and I hope you know you have it. But there's something you said there that, over, say, the last couple of years, Ireland has had quite, quite huge social movements. Um, we are now seen hilariously as probably one of the most liberal countries in Europe, uh, considering where we came from. I grew up in the 80s. And... I'm quite proud of Ireland because no matter how much shit happened over those social movements, we still managed to just about keep ourselves together. When countries like the UK are starting to tear themselves apart mm. and we see what's happening in America, we went through some serious, serious, difficult changes. And no matter what your opinion was in those social movements, we had to go through conditioning after conditioning after conditioning. People weren't being mean. They just, they just didn't know any other way. But something you said in that video, and I think it's important we hit on this, because in the last three or four years, I think the only people on earth showing leadership are young people. Mm. Uh, in the absence of utter leadership in every other capacity, because the reason I believe this is because I think young people generally see the world in two ways, right and wrong. Whereas when you get into politics and you get into you start to realize people are pushed down the pecking order because there's agendas then. And every decision you make is made upon agenda, not on best interests of people. But that thing you said, that you believe in young people, mm. uh, you believe they're the makings of this country. 
Mm. Do you want to elaborate on that? Because I believe that too. And it's my passion to figure out how I can facilitate that because I'm certainly not, I'm, I'm not here to tell them what to do because I don't know. I'm here to say I'm here to help in any way I can. What do you think? What, how do you think oh, you know, people who've gone through quite a lot in this society can turn to our young people because all we've done in the media is, is label them fucking snowflakes. So what do you do mm. when one generation starts to show leadership? We label them and we fragment ourselves further. Well, do you know the way when you say to me about, you know, how did I become a storyteller? How did I get the have a gift of saying certain things in a certain way. And I'd say to you, because I'm stupid, because in a way I know nothing. When you know nothing, when you're not the alpha male, th there's a strange way you have to almost manage other people, right? Uh, but you're not, in a sense, believing in yourself. And the, really that's the worst thing that you can do to be inflated. For example, sometimes if I'm doing a, something like this and I'm talking to this amount of amazing people, it's, this is always a danger in show business, that you walk off and for about two hours you're kind of inflated. You know, you strut around like a fucking peacock. <laughs> Somebody will see me in a bar, you know, 20 minutes after this gig and say, who the fuck's he? <laughs> Because I'm still going around like, like there's, I'm fierce important. <laughs> you, do you know who I am, by the way? <laughs> it's really an interesting thing. And there, again, there's science of the brain that will explain why that happens, the kind of sense of inflation. Ahimsa, non-violent, Viktor Frankl finding meaning in life is all about this sense of, for a second, stopping <clears throat> the visceral response to the world and allowing allowing what's out there to come at you, allowing someone else to talk. You do it. I've seen people go into rooms all stressed, I'll have to do a lot of talking in here, you know. Why don't you just keep your fucking mouth shut? Like? <laughs> you know, honestly, I've, I've gone, I've, I've seen, I, I've seen a, a guys doing workshops and, and a kind of a, a therapist person saying to them afterwards, why were you doing all the work for the participants? You left them nothing to do at all, right? So what I'm saying is there's a huge, deep spiritual liberation in being nonviolent, being passive, allowing the other person to talk. Okay. And that's what I mean about young people. That's what I mean. You can't go wrong with young people. It's like it's your day. It's your moment. I live it like in the present moment and enjoy it, and be here now, and old man, shut up. Mm. On, on that note, Michael, it's an incredible pleasure to, I, honest to God, you're an immense man. I think, I think your books, your work, as I said, they, they provide a kind of some form of real construct to what emotional intelligence is, because we might have the wrong idea what it is. And I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to be on the Where's My Mind podcast, live podcast, and I'm sure everybody can give him a massive round of applause. <laughs> and that ego. You've got 20 minutes to go and enjoy your shit, and then you're just... Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so there you go, Michael Harding. Where is my mind?